They have long been an ignored class of microbial infections. Um, our lab is specifically interested in mold or filamentous fungi that are responsible for invasive uh, infections. So these type of fungi are commonly found in the environment, and unfortunately, they have been on the rise. And this is a notice that was actually pulled from the CDC warning physicians of rising mold cases. So there's a number of reasons why this is. Um, Right. There's a number of reasons why this can be the case. Like you can attribute this to increased diagnostics and awareness, but the truth is there's also a higher number of immunocompromised individuals in the population now who are more vulnerable to micro who are more vulnerable to invasive mold infections. Um, so higher incidences of diseases like AIDS or needing chemotherapy for to treat cancer or increased immunosuppressive drugs like steroids, as well as higher incidences of mold exposure. So this past year we've seen a number of flooding and tornadoes, so natural disasters that allow these fungi to be aerosolized, and so there's higher um, exposure of these mold infections. So like I said, um, our lab is interested in these kind of fungi, aspergillus, mucromycosis, and, and, skidospor uh, and skidosporium. So my research specifically is focused on mucoralis. So mucoralis is, the, is, a, fungi, is a filamentous fungi. Um, it belongs in the mucromycota phylum, and they are commonly found in the environment, especially in the soil, where they feed on decaying matter and are a common cause of rotten plants. It's a very diverse um, uh, class, uh, order of fungi, over 20 known species, including rhizopus, mucor, and cunning chimella. So we are probably more exposed to this fungi than we realized. However, in a healthy host, inhalation of these fungi would be likely met with their first line of defense, the innate immune cells, macrophages, neutrophils, um, and their antimicrobial effect activities are very effective at clearing these fungal spores. So we will go about our daily lives without knowing that we, without having um, a disease after exposure to these fungi. However, um, in cases where fungi are able to colonize and disseminate, they can cause a very devastating disease, mucormycosis. So this is a naiad classified emerging disease, and it is characterized by this rapid angio invasion of the fungi, and uh, which results in this very, very um, rapid tissue necrosis. Um, so here you can see an instance of a lung cavity that's starting to, that has some fungi growing it there's this blood vessel that's completely plugged in with the fungi, so attesting to that angio-based nature. And now if you're squeamish, I would warn you to look away. So I'm gonna show a picture of like example of this very severe tissue necrosis. And so you can imagine how debilitating, how awful this disease is. And unfortunately, there are very limited antifungal options. One of the few options is to surgically remove basically this dead tissue. So even in the cases where you're able to survive, this is a very, this, this is a disease of a very high mortality rate, even in the cases where you're able to survive, your um, your the living the state of living afterwards would be very much um, in pain just because of like the surgical the surgical treatment required to treat this. So there are several risk factors associated with mucormycosis, such as lack of neutrophils, um, diabetes, and steroid, steroid use. And like uh, Jessica said earlier, unfortunately now it's been brought to the for to it's brought into the spotlight because of um, increased incidences of co-infections with COVID patients. So when I joined this lab, almost no one knew what mucormycosis is, but now we've seen these high incidences of mucormycosis in COVID patients, of COVID patients, especially in the in India. And so it has been titled the black fungus by the media. Um, I'd be remiss to mention that it's not that no one is happy about this. Like it is by no means the only fungus with a darker pigments. But as doctors are, bat are battling to treat these patients, it was an unfortunate testament to show how little we know about mucormycosis, especially regarding host pathogen interactions and how we need that knowledge so we can be develop better therapeutics, especially as the number of susceptible individuals in the world rise. So the few few virulence factors that have been identified thus far to, that have been shown to be critical in mucormycosis, mucormycosis pathogenesis have been identified by Ashraf Ibrahim at UCLA. And so he will actually be giving the micro talk next week. So if you want to learn more about mucormycosis, I highly recommend um, listening to that one. So here I'm showing studies that were done by his lab and where he identified two um, mucormycosis virulence factors, COTH3 and mucoricin or ricin-like toxin. So when he, he generated siRNA mutants that, and used these mutants to infect mice and you can see that these mutants had a very attenuated virulence in a mucormycosis mouse model as expected. So to learn more, so to understand more about how these virulence factors were affecting the host response during mucormycosis, um, lungs from these experiments were harvested for RNA-seq and then the transcriptomic data generated by this, um, by, um, the sequencing by the sequencing was put through an upstream regulatory analysis database. 
So what this does, it gives us a more complete view of maybe the signaling pathways involved based off the transcriptomic data. So what this does, this database contains defined signaling pathways between transcriptional regulators um, and their target genes, and they pull it from the literature and use that in the database. So based off changes in our transcriptomic data, the software predicts upstream transcriptional regulators and the particular activation state of the transcriptional regulators. So in addition to this transcriptome data, where we have a list of genes that are either um, that uh, where we have this list of um, genes that are differentially expressed, we now also have predictions of signaling pathways that may be activated or repressed according to that transcriptome data. So it's a nice complement um, in our omics data. So when we get our transcriptional regulator, um, when we get our when we get our data back from this um, database, we get a z-score, which infers the activation state of these predicted transcriptional regulators. And when we looked at specifically regulators that are associated with important immune pathways, such as pathogen recognition or overall um, fungal immunity. Um, we see that many of these pathways are not activated during infection of wild type rhizopus delamar. Even up to 72 hours, there's really no change in pathways that are associated with, for example, TLR3, um, MID88, IL1 beta, very important pro inflammatory response, uh, uh, pro inflammatory signaling pathways and in initiating an immune response. So comparatively, these mutants where the virulence factors are silent show activation of these important pathways, suggesting that mucorallies employ multiple mechanisms to evade host defenses that could kill the fungi and prevent dissemination. And I'm not showing this here, but we also did, uh, we also did similar studies in aspergillus and other fungal molds. And we saw that um, these fungi were actually able to turn on all these pathways. We saw this at very, as early as 24 hours. So in contrast to these other fungal molds, um, Rhizopus delamar shows from this data that there is a suppression of sorts of these important immune pathways. And there's a, some sort of immune evasion mechanism at play. And this, is not, and this is supported by clinical studies as well. So despite that severe angioinvasion and, uh, and tissue damage seen in mucormycosis, there is very little and inflammatory responses seen in a clinical setting. So one study looked at the expression of interferon gamma, which is a very pro-inflammatory cytokine in aspergillus versus mucorallis patients. And the study saw that a high number of aspergillus patients um, expressed the cytokine in the in, this, in the tissue, whereas most uh, whereas mucorallis patients didn't have presence of the cytokine. And furthermore, a recent study showed that interferon gamma mediated signaling was able to improve fungal clearance during mucormycosis, further supporting the idea that there is some immune evasion mechanism at play for these pro-inflammatory pathways. So with this data set, we now have a list of potential signaling pathways to, uh, to explore and understanding host pathogen interactions during mucormycosis, especially in the context of immune evasion. So one pathway that we noticed that was not only not activated, but also act actively repressed during the initial stages of 24 hours is um, pathways associated with NOS2. So why is this interesting? NOS2, or otherwise known as INOS, is part of a group of enzymes called nitric oxide synthases. So these enzymes catalyze the production of nitric oxide from L-arginine. And there are three isoforms of this enzyme. And INOS is distinguished from the other two by being the only inducible form. So the other two isoforms constitutively produce nitric oxide um, in small amounts, whereas INOS produce, is um, induced to produce very large amounts in response to inflammatory conditions, such as stimulation from pro-inflammatory cytokines like interferon gamma. And these are found, and these are expressed predominantly in immune cells like macrophages. So this form is usually is produced in response to a pathogen and is a very well-documented antimicrobial uh, molecule. So a pathogen that would be able to block INOS signaling and, and in turn block nitric oxide production would theoretically be able to survive in the macrophages. And this, it has been shown that mucorallis mold can survive in lung macrophages, especially alveolar macrophages, which are often the very first immune cell that encounters any respiratory pathogen. And that plays a critical role in initiating the immune response and alerting the rest of the immune system to the presence of a pathogen. So, but beyond the antimicrobial properties, nitric, there's many other reasons why we thought nitric oxide was worth um, studying. So nitric oxide, beyond, its, beyond being an antimicrobial molecule, it's involved in many physio physiological processes that are related to mucormycosis pathogenesis, especially um, fine tuning or activating the immune response and angiogenesis. Additionally, there's an, there's an evolutionary precedent for mucorallis fungi having a mechanism to evade um, nitric oxide. So remember that this is a, <clears throat> excuse me, this is an opportunistic pathogen that's found in the environment. It is foremost a plant pathogen and has been known to cause root rot in fruits and vegetables like this banana that we see here. 
So plant, so plants have a very different immune system from the animal kingdom and, and from us. Um, one of the very few things that is conserved between these two kingdoms in regards to immunity is the importance of nitric oxide as an anti-defense microbial um, molecule and a signaling molecule. So similar to the animal kingdom, nitric oxide plays a huge role, not just in defense mechanisms, but also in plant fungal um, and plant fungal interactions. So this suggests that maybe that um, the ability to squash nitric oxide signaling is a conserved immune evasion mechanism based from mucoralysis time as a plant pathogen and is now carried over as uh, into its time as a mucormycosis causing agent. So to summarize all that, we have three reasons to suggest to, to look at um, mucoralis in context of INOS signaling. We have our in vivo transcriptomic data suggesting a down regulation of nitric oxide genes. We have clinical data suggesting that there's a limited inflammatory response and that there is, and furthering the idea that there is some immune evasion mechanisms at play. Additionally, there is this evolutionary precedent due to the importance of nitric oxide signaling in plant and animal immunity. So that has given us a, um, our overall hypothesis that mucoralis somehow block nitric oxide accumulation to suppress host immune responses during mucormycosis. So first of all, to, vary, to start all this and to verify, uh, we want to make sure, we want to see if NOS, INOS is actually um, produced during um, macrophage infection. So what we did is we performed two PCR macrophages at four and eight hours post-infection. And as a positive control, we use um, LPS and interferogamma. These are very, these are very well characterized known inducers of um, nitric oxide production, and then use what is called a GRIS assay to quantify the nitric oxide in the media. So you can see at four and eight hours, there's this very, very high induction of INOS um, transcription um, in our positive control. And the rhizopus infect the macrophages. These are, oh, by the way, these are MHS cells, which are a mouse alveolar macrophage cell line. So at an MOI5, you can see at four and eight hours, there is this high um, induction of, nit of INOS genes. So maybe not as high as our positive control, but still considerably higher than our uninfected control. So about at four hours for us, it's maybe tenfold, but eight hours, you see, you see this high, almost 1,000 um, fold um, induction of INOS. So, to, and then when we, but when we look at the actual nitric oxide production, we see even when we extend the um, data up to 48 hours, there's no nitric oxide being produced by the rise of his Delamar um, infected samples. You see this accumulation with the positive control, but there's no nitric oxide whatsoever within, um, within our rise of his Delamar infected um, conditions. So to make sure that the depletion of nitric oxide is not due to a, a lack of INOS being expressed, we did a series of competition experiments where we included a new condition where we infected the macrophages with both rhizopus del with rhizopus delmar and LPS gamma and interferon gamma. So that was our positive control and now we combined them. And then at, four, at eight hours, we look at um, RNA and then 24 hours, we look at um, the nitric oxide production. To, so this is basically to ensure that the, all the right signals were being made to make sure that, nitric ox that the reduction of nitric oxide wasn't due to a lack of reduced nitric INOS expression. And so we did these we did these competitions experiments, and we see that with two different species of mucoralis, um, Rhizopus delmar and Cunningham Ella, we see this high induction of INOS um, in our combined uh, in our combined setting. And in this case of Rhizopus delmar, there's actually a small, significant um, higher induction. But the main point is that they have on par levels of INOS transcription induced. But once again, we do not see any nitric oxide production. It is almost completely ablated in both these species, suggesting it's not a species-specific phenomena. Um, to make sure it wasn't a cell culture artifact, we repeated them in two other macrophage cell lines, um, raw cells, which are another mouse macrophages, and bone marrow-derived macrophages from our collaborators at the Pager Lab at UMB. And once again, we see a similar phenomenon where the INOS expression is on par, but once again, there's no nitric oxide production. So, the further the next stages of our research, we're really understanding the mechanism, like how is mucoralis able to deplete this ox this nitric oxide production. So first thing we wanted to make sure is is this due to lack of INOS protein during the mucoralis infection. So I performed a Western blot um, to probe for the INOS protein, and once again we see a similar trend. Um, <clears throat> there is no di significant difference between the, our positive control alone and our positive control. In, um, co-infected with um, Rhizopus delamar as, as far as the amount of NOS protein being made. And there is some in the, not, in the uh, Rhizopus delamar alone. You just can't really see it in the blot because I had to dim down the exposure. So next you wanna know, does mucoralis need to be alive to suppress these, this nitric oxide production? So we heat killed this um, 
So what we do is we take the spores, we put them in, in 65 degrees for two hours, and then add interferon gamma to, to create that competition experiment. And we see here that our live rhizopus delamar, along with um, our positive control, once again, we aren't able to produce any nitric oxide, but when we use dead um, rhizopus delamar, you see that rescue of the nitric oxide production. So we know that rhizopus delamar needs to be alive to, in order to suppress the nitric oxide production. Next, we want to see if mucoralis can detoxify the environment by removing it from the system. Um, so what we do that is to do that, we incubate rhizopus with different conditions of the chemical nitric oxide donor, and we add different concentrations of this compound into the media with or without a fungus and compare it to the amount of nitric oxide being produced compare to see if the fungi itself is able to re remove the chemically generated nitric oxide. So we see a high concentration of nitric oxide. So we see that at high concentrations of DITA nonoate, this nitric oxide donor, um, Rhizopus was unable to deplete, was only able to deplete approximately 20% of the nitric oxide in the system. And if you look at levels that we actually see in our infective, in our macrophages around 60 micromolar, there isn't really that much of a difference as far as, as far as the amount of nitric oxide that the fungus itself is able to pull from the system. So we know from here that it's able to partially reduce it by itself, but there's another mechanism at play. So at this point, we took we decided to see if mucoralis is secreting a compound that can suppress this induced uh, nitric oxide in macrophages. And to do that, we made what we call spent media, which is basically a fungal conditioned media. We took um, rhizopus delamar and we when we cultured it in our PMI media, which is the media that we grow our macrophages in. We cultured it for 24 hours and compared to media alone. And at the end of 24 hours. We basically take that media and we spin down several times to separate the spores from the media. So we just want to make, we take the actual fungal away and what we want is whatever's been secreted in that media. So we don't filter it. We just use several centrifuge steps to separate the two. And we streak on a plate just to make sure that there is actually no presence of um, the fungal, the fungus in this media. And you can see five days after streaking, there's no fungus there. So to that media, we add interferon gamma and LPS, and then we use that to treat um, MHS cells for 24 hours. And what we saw was very exciting. We saw that the spent media can actually suppress this induced nitric oxide production in the macrophages. So here we had the regular media, which was just media that was also in, in the um, incubator for 24 hours. And the spent media was able to reduce the nitric oxide production up to 24 hours. When we take this spent media, put it in um, 65 degrees for two hours, and so essentially like you know, heat killing it, we see that this heat killed spent media still was able to reduce this nitric oxide prediction. There's actually this nitric oxide production. There's actually no significant difference between spent media by itself by itself and then when you heat kill it. So what we know, so suggesting that this whatever compound that's being secreted that's able to suppress this to suppress this nitric oxide production is a heat stable molecule. So to conclude, I'm sorry, I'm, I know I'm a little over. So to quickly conclude, we have this data, clinical data and transcriptomic data that suggests a repression of important immune pathways during mucormycosis. And we through that, we saw that mucoralis species were able to do, were able to repress induced nitric oxide production in multiple macrophage models, and that this nitric oxide um, production is blocked by a secreted heat stable factor by the fungus. And our hope is that by continuing to study this phenomena, perhaps there may be a way in which nitric oxide may be used as a novel treatment for mucormycosis as it has been for other infectious diseases. So with that, I want to thank um, my lab and all our collaborators. I'm so sorry for going over and I'll leave it to you guys. That was great. Thank you very much, Alex, yeah, for a wonderful yeah. talk. Um, and so we'll take all questions for Alex, um, as well as Itai at the end. So please enter them into the chat. Um, and now our next speaker is Itai Doran, who's coming to us from um, Ilian Ilyevslev at uh, Cornell, Weill Cornell Medicine. And Itai did his bachelor's of science at Emory University. Um, he was then a research assistant at the University of Pennsylvania for a year before entering graduate school at Weill Cornell Medicine. And today he's going to talk to us about uh, fungi in the gut. Ita? Here we go. Okay. You can hear me, right? Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, thanks, Jessica, and uh, thanks to the uh, seminar organizing committee for uh, giving me the opportunity to present, to present my thesis work um, to you guys. So, 
Um, so uh, there's a growing body of research uh, that demonstrates that uh, the gut microbiota, which make up about one to 2% of the total microbes in the intestine, um, are uh, increasingly, uh, they're a critical component of, uh, of the uh, intestinal microbiota in that they can either, uh, they can contribute both to uh, protective immune, uh, the priming of immune, uh, protective immune responses, uh, but they could also be a, a reservoir of opportunistic fungal pathogens. Um, and uh, in the case of the latter, um, the, uh, an antifungal vaccine or um, a monoclonal antibody uh, or an monoclonal antibody therapy uh, would be useful, but there are challenges to developing those in that uh, fungi uh, exhibit like a lot of variety and uh, morphological flexibility. Um, and uh, so I believe for these reasons, my thesis work has a significant therapeutic potential since um, I'm assessing antibody responses that are induced by a range of fungi that are uh, colonizing the intestine. Um, so uh, in the intestine, the antibody response to commensal microbes is dominated by uh, secretory IgA, um, which is uh, generated in the lamina propria, in gut-associated lymphoid tissue, GALT, uh, and secreted uh, across the intestinal uh, epithelium uh, into the lumen to um, protect the intestinal barrier and maintain its integrity. Um, however, uh, recent studies have also demonstrated that there's a significant amount of uh, systemic IgG that's circulating in the blood that also recognizes commensal microbes, which is surprising uh, since there is a uh, several layers of tissue between circulating uh, uh, systemic IgG antibodies and the commensal uh, microbes that are in the gut. Um, these antibodies have been shown to be uh, colonization dependent, so they're not there in germ-free mice, for example, um, and they confer uh, protective uh, uh, they confer protection uh, when transferred uh, passively, for example, to uh, uh, against uh, gut disseminating infections. However, uh, until uh, it, although it, this is growing as well, but uh, until recently, uh, little has been known about uh, whether there is a antifungal repertoire of systemic uh, IgG antibodies. Um, and uh, what, if so, what are their functions and uh, what is their induction mechanism? So to uh, probe this in a high throughput and unbiased manner, we generated uh, a technique that's based on flow cytometry, which we called uh, multi-kingdom flow cytometry or multi-cap, uh, uh, multi, uh, yeah, multi-kingdom uh, antibody profiling. Um, and this technique, um, it uses the reservoir of the natural reservoir of microbes that are in the intestine um, as epitopes for uh, antibody binding. Um, and by uh, assessing uh, fecal, uh, the, the fecal microbes uh, antibody binding before and after incubation with serum, we can measure whether uh, antibodies uh, that bind commensal microbes are uh, serial, uh, uh, from the serum or are uh, secretory in origin. So um, after uh, incubating or not with serum, uh, we can identify microbes by uh, cyber green binding, which is a DNA binding dye. As you can see in specific pathogen-free or SPF mice, um, there's a cyber high population uh, that represents the live microbes discernible from dead microbes that are uh, uh, found in the environment, in bedding, et cetera. Um, then the live microbes are not there in the germ-free feces. Additionally, unique to our, uh, our staining protocol, um, we can distinguish the fungi from the uh, the uh, abundant rest of the, uh, the the bacteria that are found in feces with uh, calcofluor white, which binds to cell wall chitin uh, very nicely. You can see this distinct population here um, within which we can then measure uh, antibody binding. So, um, uh, so uh, we can see, uh, we see that uh, upon serum incubation and only upon serum incubation, um, about 10 to 20% of the uh, total uh, fungi found in the gut are uh, bound by IgG. Uh, and additionally, we see that uh, when uh, the serum from B cell deficient uh, mu -MT knockout mice uh, is applied, we uh, lack that IgG binding, um, which demonstrates the, the uh, it confirms the uh, specificity of this assay. Um, so sorry, you guys are in the way here. Okay. Um, so uh, 
together. Uh, together, uh, this data demonstrates that there's a uh, significant uh, circulating systemic antifungal IgG uh, repertoire uh, that's uh, found in the mice. And additionally, uh, although I don't show it here, these uh, antibodies, these antifungal antibodies are gut colonization dependent and they're not there in uh, the germ-free mice. Um, so uh, we see in the uh, human microbiota, when we uh, stain by multicap, we see similar uh, binding patterns. So we wanted to figure out um, what are the species that are specifically uh, coded, uh, preferentially coded with IgG. Um, and this is a question uh, that we asked because others have shown that um, the, uh, there is uh, the uh, identification of uh, preferentially coded antibody, uh, uh, preferentially coded uh, microbes in the gut. Um, although they may not be the most abundant species, they tend to be the drivers of uh, uh, immunological uh, pro-inflammatory responses or protective immune, res uh, uh, protective, uh, immune responses. Um, and so to assess those, we uh, stained uh, for IgG and IgA binding. Uh, and when we do that in the, uh, the human microbiota, we identify three distinct populations um, which are highlighted here, um, two of which are IgG bound. Um, and we sorted each of these three populations and uh, we then uh, sequenced with uh, ITS1 to uh, obtain the, these distinct and diverse uh, populations that we can compare uh, between each other. So uh, for each of the sorted populations, uh, we could then generate a coding index for each of the species that were identified within the sorted sequenced populations. Um, and these were uh, generated by uh, comparing the relative abundance of a particular fungal species um, in either of the uh, IgG uh, bound populations relative to, that, uh, to the relative abundance of that species in the IgG unbound population. Um, and the resulting coding index, um, as is indicated in the, uh, the uh, equation on the graph in the bottom right, um, when it's positive, uh, it signifies that there's higher relative abundance um, and therefore enrichment uh, when uh, the populations are sorted, uh, when the, the uh, sorted IgG bound populations, uh, uh, when you look in those specifically, uh, indicating that there's preferential IgG coding. So, um, the box and whisker plots here in the bottom left indicate uh, they, they're a summary of the uh, coding indices of uh, this. Uh, this is a subset of uh, all of the fungi that we identified through sequencing, um, but these are some of the most, uh, the most uh, abundant species. And uh, in general, we mostly find that there is uh, no dif uh, significant difference in the relative abundance of um, fungal species when you sort, uh, it's when you stratify by the IgG binding. However, um, in Candida albicans specifically, uh, uh, demonstrates preferential coding by uh, IgG. Um, so to look at uh, whether there is that connection that I spoke of earlier between preferential IgG coding and the uh, uh, potency of the uh, anti of, uh, inducing antifungal IgG in the serum, we took some of these uh, commonly identified uh, fungi and monocolonized germ-free mice, which, uh, as I said before, lack uh, serum IgG to begin with. So um, the, the connection that we ended up observing that connection in that um, after two weeks of uh, monocolonization, uh, we observed that Canada albicans uh, is uniquely able to potently induce a serum IgG response. Um, a serum IgG response uh, that's significantly higher uh, than uh, any other uh, fungal species that we identified. So uh, this uh, demonstrates that Candida albicans is uh, uniquely able to, uh, it's uh, uniquely the driver of the antifungal uh, serum IgG response that we observe um, uh, that is induced by commensal uh, fungal, uh, the commensal uh, microbiota. So um, to look at the therapeutic potential of uh, the um, commensal fungal induced IgG, we uh, took those germ-free monocolonized mice and purified the serum, um, which we all henceforth refer to as a CLB IgG. Um, and uh, what we did was we, uh, once we purified that serum, 
uh, we assess its therapeutic potential in a systemic dissemination model uh, from the gut. So we transferred passively those uh, C-ALB IgGs to SPF mice that were uh, already colonized with Candida albicans. Um, and then we induced systemic dissemination through immunosuppression with a, a chemotherapy drug, uh, cyclophosphamide. Um, the mice usually succumbed within four weeks. Um, however, uh, when we treated, uh, pre-treated with uh, this uh, passive transfer of C. alb IgG, we observed that nearly all of the mice survived. And uh, we also observed a significantly decreased uh, kidney fungal burden, uh, demonstrating that the, uh, the gut colonization is, a, uh, is a, a valid way to induce uh, protective uh, systemic IgG uh, antibodies. Um, and I would love to go uh, into further detail in some of the uh, studies that I, uh, I, I published in the cell paper that we published uh, uh, earlier in February, um, uh, because I also demonstrated that we could do this with Candida auris uh, in a systemic infection model, uh, and also that uh, these antibody responses are dependent upon uh, CARD9 signaling within CX3CR1 positive macrophages. But I'm going to uh, just have to refer you to that paper for lack of time. Uh, apologies for this always like uh, blurring. I don't know why this blurs, but uh, just a quick summary of what I was showing you. Uh, just that multi-cap platform, uh, we can use it to observe uh, IgG-coded uh, gut microbiota population um, that we can uh, sort and identify specifically uh, uh, fungi that are enriched by uh, IgG uh, coding, which uh, demonstrate that Canada is a, a driver of antifungal IgG induction. Um, and we show that the uh, that feeding induces protective IgGs that can be passively transferred to confer protection against systemic uh, systemic candidiasis. Um, so I'm just going to uh, move then to the uh, IgA side, the secretory IgA side of my uh, thesis work. Um, so uh, the um, the antifungal uh, IgA response is, uh, it's, IgA has already been shown, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to contribute a lot to uh, the uh, maintenance of uh, commensalism and to protect the intestinal barrier integrity through uh, immunologic exclusion, where it binds to something and prevents, kind of like locks it in place, uh, the microbes that would otherwise uh, interfere with the intestinal barrier. It can neutralize toxins. There's a number of uh, things that uh, secretory IgA has been shown to do in the intestine. Um, so to just, uh, to just uh, when we looked at uh, the bimulticap at the antibody response in the absence of serum, uh, as others, plenty of others have shown, IgA is the, the dominant isotype response. Um, and in our case, we show that it's specific, specifically to fungi, it's the dominant IgA, uh, the dominant response in the uh, uh, healthy uh, human gut and wild type mouse species, uh, uh, mouse gut at steady state. Um, Additionally, as I showed with the uh, germ-free monoclonization uh, model earlier, Canada albicans is a, un a uniquely potent driver of secretory IgA, um, as measured by the uh, total IgA uh, in the gut after uh, two weeks of colonization. Uh, and that's relative to other uh, common commensals. Um, so uh, it led us to question, uh, what are the, uh, what could IgA, uh, secretory IgA possibly be uh, doing in its role in maintaining uh, the, could it be contributing to the commensalism of uh, IgA in the intestine? Um, and uh, so uh, we, we turned to the, uh, we, to asking whether there was morphological specificity for this uh, secretory IgA uh, since um, the, uh, the, uh, Candida is uniquely able to exist as yeast and hyphae or pseudo hyphae uh, in the intestine, um, and the uh, the morphological status is critical to um, its ability to, uh, to to remain as a commensal or uh, become an opportunistic invasive pathogen. Um, so to observe the morphological uh, specificity of uh, anti Candida secretory IgA binding, we were lucky enough to. Um, receive a uh, dual reporter from our collaborator, Jesus Pla, um, which I'll henceforth refer to as CADREP. Um, it is constitutively expressing the uh, GFP under the ENO1 promoter, 
um, so that we could identify it by microscopy or flow cytometry. It also um, expresses uh, RFP under the hyphal uh, wall protein one promoter. Um, so it expresses RFP when it's hyphal uh, and it's filamenting, uh, producing a, a during filamentation. Um, so we can see the, the frequency of hyphae uh, within the GFP constitutive population. Um, incubating the CADREP strain with a uh, healthy human uh, fecal supernatant uh, that we, uh, which allows for uh, secretory IgA binding and looking under microscopy, we could quantify that um, there's a lot of co-localization of uh, the um, IgA and the RFP signal. Um, and indeed quantifying demonstrates that um, the uh, IgA binding uh, occurs at a higher frequency within uh, among total the total hyphae that we observed by microscopy uh, compared to the yeast form. So there seems to be a preferential IgA binding um, uh, to hyphae and uh, to see if there was a uh, there was a relevance in uh, candida fitness in the gut, we conducted a competitive uh, colonization assay uh, where we colonized uh, our SPF mice, which are naive to candida albicans with a one-to-one -one mix of RFP constitutive expressing wild type candida um, and uh, EFG1 mutant uh, candida albicans strain, which is yeast locked. Um, as others have demonstrated, uh, in the presence of an adaptive immune response and uh, relevant to us in the presence of uh, IgA. Um, the, in the wild type background, after about 10 days, we see a significant uh, outperformance of uh, the yeast lock strain relative to the uh, wild type candida albicans strain. Uh, however, in the RAG1 knockouts, um, in the absence of an adaptive immune response, we see almost immediately the opposite response where the wild type is outperforming the uh, EFG1, the, the yeast locked uh, strain. Additionally, um, returning to uh, the uh, CAD rep strain, um, we uh, colonized uh, we colonized mice with uh, this strain and uh, looked at the uh, the frequency of hyphae um, within that uh, GFP positive population to see if there would be uh, changes in the frequency of hyphae in the absence of uh, an adaptive uh, secretory IgA immune response, uh, looking in uh, our B cell deficient mu and T mice or the RAG1 uh, B cell and T cell deficient mice. And we observe uh, indeed that uh, relative to wild type mice with an intact uh, secretory IgA response, um, the B cell deficient mu T and the adaptive immune deficient RAG1 knockout mice um, have a higher frequency of hyphae. Um, have a higher frequency of uh, uh, hyphae in the intestine when we look at that, uh, that reporter strain. Um, so uh, collectively, this uh, suggests that there is um, the secretory IgA antibodies have a uh, significant impact on the uh, hyphal morphogenesis in the gut and uh, helps to maintain commensalism um, and kind of shifts the candida away from hyphal uh, formation. Oh, and notably, uh, we observed that uh, the hyphal fraction uh, of the CAD rep in the gut of the wild type mice has higher uh, frequency of IgA binding than the yeast fraction does when we look in the same sample. Um, we, uh, we also looked at the uh, two uh, phagocyte subsets that are uh, common, commonly uh, found throughout the small intestine and the colon and are significant contributors, uh, and they're known to be as uh, significant contributors to the uh, IgA induction. Um, and uh, so uh, that is first the CX3CR1 macrophages, which uh, contribute a lot to uh, the secretory IgA uh, induction in the colon. Um, and our lab has in the past shown that it's critical for uh, the uh, antifungal um, uh, protective uh, uh, T cell uh, T cell priming um, from the colon, and um, additionally, we looked at uh, the conventional dendritic cells that are dependent on the IRF four transcription factor, um, and this subset known as is known as CDC twos. They're critical for um, the induction of IgA against uh, bacteria and uh, dietary antigens, uh, mostly in the small intestine. 
Um, there are also uh, critical contributors to the uh, uh, IgA induction in, in uh, the Peyer's patches, which are the secondary lymphoid tissues spread throughout the small intestine, uh, mostly concentrated in the ileum, um, that are uh, major sites for affinity maturation and the uh, induction of high uh, affinity uh, specific uh, antibody responses to penetrant commensals and uh, invasive pathogens. So focusing on those Peyer's patches, um, we observed that uh, candida feeding results in a, uh, a lot of class switching, uh, an increase in the IgA positive uh, B cell frequency uh, within the Peyer's patches in response to candida feeding, which corresponds to uh, an increase in the luminal IgA uh, that I showed earlier. Um, and this uh, IgA uh, frequency was uh, significantly decreased in the uh, dendritic cell population, uh, in the dendritic cell uh, depletion model, uh, but not the uh, CX3CR1 depletion macrophage uh, uh, depletion model. Um, additionally, when I looked uh, within the uh, Peyer's patches, these uh, lymphoid tissues, we have uh, the formation of germinal centers um, and uh, these B cells, which are receiving signals from uh, specialized follicular dendritic cells, um, are undergoing high amounts of somatic hypermutation, uh, which is the uh, uh, process that uh, leads to the affinity maturation that eventually generates the high affinity IgA antibody responses. Um, and they're marked with uh, these two uh, markers, uh, CE95 or FAST and uh, the GL7 antigen. Um, within this germinal center population in the Pyrus patches, uh, we observed that candida albicans is inducing this, uh, the, the expansion of this population, specifically the IgA uh, uh, germinal center B cells. Um, this effect is abrogated in the uh, depletion of the CDC2 population, but not the CX3, CR1 macrophage depletion. Um, and uh, this, uh, so uh, the, the CX3CR1 macrophage uh, depletion model does uh, result in a, uh, in a loss of the uh, induction of the IgA response that candida colonization induces in the colon specifically, um, showing this like uh, the, these two phagocyte populations are uh, both contributing to the anti-candida IgA response, but are in a, in a compartmentalized fashion. Uh, through separate mechanisms. Um, however, interestingly, uh, the depletion of either of these cell subsets leads to a significant decrease in anti-candida IgA titers and uh, an increase in the granularity of the fungi when we observe uh, the colon contents uh, or uh, the, the intestinal contents in general by multicap. Um, which we have since determined is indicative of uh, higher like uh, frequency of hyphal formation. Um, so it does appear that uh, depleting either pathway for antifungal IgA induction has uh, it, the both uh, pathways are critical for uh, the induction of IgA in, in uh, different ways. Um, additionally, uh, when we look at the Peyer's patches after uh, colonizing with uh, wild type candida, or uh, yeast locked uh, EFG1 CPH1 uh, double mutant, um, we observe that uh, the, there's significantly uh, less IgA class switching uh, at the Peyer's patches um, in, in the yeast locked, uh, uh, the yeast locked colonized mice than the wild type Canada colonized mice, um, despite the fact that there are higher uh, Canada burdens uh, in the gut, in the yeast locked strain. Um, and interestingly, uh, when we uh, assess the uh, reactivity of these induced antibodies um, and compared the uh, hyphal response to uh, the, the yeast response, we observe um, that feeding with the wild type uh, candida leads to a skewing of the antibody response towards the uh, uh, hyphal reactivity while uh, feeding with um, the uh, yeast locked response uh, does not uh, lead to uh, uh, change any like changes in the reactivity between uh, hyphal and uh, yeast lysates, um, suggesting that there is um, that uh, part of that uh, pot the potency of the wild type candida induction um, is uh, due to uh, the, the induction of anti 
anti-Canada IEA responses specifically to uh, HIFL, um, to, to HIFL specific uh, targets. And so um, two of the targets that popped out when we, uh, that when we looked at them were uh, uh, the induction of Canada License Secretary, uh, anti-Canada License Secretary IGA, um, as well as the virulence factor SAP6. Um, and uh, additionally, uh, when we looked at flagellin, uh, there was no, uh, there was no uh, significant effect. So it appears that this is in fact a Canada specific response. Um, uh, the final thing I'm gonna uh, show you guys is just that um, the, uh, to investigate whether the antifungal IgA uh, uh, that is found in the gut is affected by inflammatory disease, we looked in um, Crohn's disease patients, which in the serum, uh, you can clearly identify an elevated uh, ASCA uh, IgA and IgG responses. But uh, when we looked in feces, as you can see here, um, we see a decrease in SAP6 and anti candida lysin secretory IgA, as well as that increase in the granularity, again, that I talked about earlier, um, demonstrating that there is a dysfunctional uh, secretory IgA response uh, and uh, skewing towards hyphomorphologies of candida, perhaps in the uh, Crohn's disease gut. Um, and uh, I think I ran over, so I'm just uh, going to skip to the acknowledgments. Um, and uh, just thank my thesis advisor, Ilya and Ilya, my committee, the lab members, and all of our collaborators. So, yeah, uh, thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much for a great talk. Uh, so we'll take questions for Alex first. Um, and if you would please enter any questions for Itai or Alex into the chat, uh, we'll go back and forth. Uh, and so Alex, your first question is from Carolina Cole who asks whether spent media can inhibit recombinant INOS? Um, and do you think that this is a direct enzyme inhibition? So we haven't looked at that. The spent media is a more recent um, discovery. Um, as far as whether it is a direct enzyme inhibition. So for the longest time, I was convinced that this was a nutritional immunity mechanism at play since iron is known, or specifically heme is known to be a cofactor for INOS memorization and um, mucoralis, uh, right, specifically ricevis, has been shown to have this, like, um, a lot of iron acquisition genes as virulence factors. However, um, not to say that that's not true, but in the experiments I've done where I tried to see if that was the case, I wasn't able to, um, there was, the experiments I did did not show that, like, iron, for example, supplementation did rescue nitric oxide. Um, I think it still might be worth looking more into, but actually our current hypothesis, um, what, at least what, what we think might be the molecule at play working into um, working to disrupt um, INOS activity, um, we think it might have some sugar binding um, potential. So maybe um, there was a recent paper showing that glycosylation of INOS does actually impact its activities. So there are multiple, so to answer your question, there are like, there are several ways in which it could. And I think that uh, specifically the sugar binding aspect of it might be mm -hmm. the one that's at play. Okay. Um so uh, that sort of leads to my question, which is, uh, mm -hmm. do rhizopus cells that lack pigment still inhibit INOS? So um, I've been trying to do that. So you can make what we call albino rhizopus cells by growing them in these copper deficient um, settings, and they'll produce these live um, white spores. These spores are very fragile, and at least not now. We've been I, I have not been able to like cultivate enough to make to do an experiment. I do think though that like that twenty percent induction. So like early when I showed uh, reduction when I showed that the nitric that the fungus itself was able to deplete the um, environmental nitric oxide, and it reduces it by about like twenty percent. I think nitric. I think melanin is at play there, especially since mm -hmm. we know that melanin is a huge virulence factor for fungi and actually has some detoxification properties. Great. Um, and so uh, first question for Ita, and that is, what do you imagine might be the mechanism for candida antigens moving from the gut to the serum IgG and inducing a response? Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, it seems like, uh, I mean, uh, I, the question kind of is, um, we, we definitely, uh, in our IgG paper, we've shown that um, we find like candida uh, we find candida DNA in the spleen um, where we observe uh, an induction of, uh, we observe class switching towards uh, uh, IgG. So 
um, it does appear that you know something is getting in there. Um, we couldn't uh, identify a live candida in the uh, in the spleen. So, um, and we we know that CX three CR one uh, is capable of like phagocytosis in candida. So I um, I the the um, it's definitely something with uh, the the uh, candida. Uh, it, it seems like candida uh, is being sensed by CX three CR one, um, and the uh, there definitely needs to be like a, a we definitely need to investigate uh, whether there is uh, like um, if the CX three CR one is uh, perhaps like shuttling it there, uh, or uh, if uh, there there could also be a handoff between. Um, the dendritic cells and the macrophages, which is something that people have described. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, when we knock out the uh, IRF, uh, when we use the IRF for um, uh, depletion, we don't see any changes in IgG. So um, I don't know if that's the case. There's uh, the, the exact details are something we're definitely looking into. It could also just be very low level uh, uh, escape from the intestine, but um, yeah, just uh, I, the CX three CR one definitely seems to be involved. Um, these these macrophages that are uh, you know reaching out through the uh, through the colon and kind of sensing the fungi. Yeah, very cool. And I'm also intrigued by the, the hypothesis of IgA sort of shaping the the fungal morphology within the gut. Um, and I was wondering if you'd looked at uh, anything like the protea the proteome or the transcriptome of fungal cells that have bound IgA. Oh, and dude, how that that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely something I'd uh, definitely something I'd love to see. I mean, um, I, I could definitely refer to you. Um, you know, the uh, June Rounds Group. Uh, they uh, they published a paper uh, a little before us that uh, had on a similar topic, um, and in that they sorted. They did sort. I think. Uh, I think it was like all fecal material, um, but they were uh, they colonized with Canada uh, albicans and did uh, uh, they matched some of the sequences to the uh, Canada genome, um, and uh, it was in uh, wild type versus rag one knockout. Um, so I can't remember if they did like an IgA knockout, but um, that would be something that would be I, I would be very interested to see like an IgA specific. Uh, 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 like an IgA knockout mouse, uh, uh, or just like a, maybe like an in vitro model, just like IgA bound versus unbound, like sorting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been shown for like beta uh, B, B theta iota micron, um, a common commensal in the gut that um, IgA binding is, uh, it um, uh, changes the metabolic activity there too. Um, so yeah, definitely something like pretty interesting. Uh, Very cool. All right, and back to Alex. Uh, Matt Blanco says, I think I missed it, but what is the fungal signal that's recognized to trigger the interferon gamma uh, nitrioxide production? We don't know. We haven't looked at that. We haven't looked at what specifically the lag it is. To be honest, like some of the like, you know, cell surf, like the cell wall, the surface of mucoralis is rather poorly defined, especially in comparison to aspergillus. We don't know, but there are multiple ways to induce um, INOS. All right, and Kelly Shepardson says, very cool data. Since these are plant pathogens, I'm wondering if the molecule that's secreted is not just heat stable, but also UV stable. I have no, we haven't, we haven't done that, but that's actually a really interesting idea as far as like tying that back into the plant pathogen. No, we haven't looked at that, but yeah, that'd be definitely something interesting to see. Very cool. Um, and then sort of related to that, are farmers at increased risk for mucorellis infection? I. I personally don't trust any epidemiological or, or like most clinical or epidemiological data when it comes to mucormycosis, just because there's not really a precedent for reporting it. And it also has been misdiagnosed a lot of times as aspergillus. Um, but there is a huge farmer's population in India and India is the country that suffered the most from these mucormycosis COVID patients. So perhaps, but it's all correlated. I don't think it's been studied. Okay. Um, all right, those are all the questions in the chat. So if anyone has any more questions, feel free to turn on your mic. Um, otherwise, uh, we will close out this month's session. And uh, thanks to, two, to our two fantastic speakers. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. And I hope to see you all in January. Thank you. Thank you. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays.